Hey everybody, I'm your host Cal, and I'm going to talk to you guys about making backgrounds. Think of every movie that you've ever seen, or a book that you've ever read. They all have one thing in common. They take place somewhere. That's what a background is. Now, there are a lot of different types of backgrounds out there. Science fiction backgrounds, fantasy backgrounds, steampunk backgrounds, horror backgrounds, and tons and tons of other types of backgrounds. Which one fits for you? That all depends on the type of character you have and the story that you want to depict. Not all themes will fit into everything. That said, every theme is worth exploring. Say you have a character, a really great character, but you notice there's something missing. Can you see what it is? The background, it's blank. Now, a blank background isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's actually a type of approach called minimalist, which some people do prefer. If it's your style, feel free to use it. But if you want to do something else, then this next part is for you. Which leads us to phase one, the thought process. Envisioning a background. This step is actually the hardest part of the whole process. Sometimes inspiration just doesn't seem to come to you. So try to do something to liven things up, get the juices flowing. Maybe have a beverage, or two, or three, or four, or five. Oh god, that one's a week old! At some point, the inspiration will finally come to you. And once it does, you'll be on the fast track to phase two, the drawing. Knowing what to draw is only half of the battle. The other half is actually drawing it. Usually, I like to start out with a traditional background, as in done on pen and paper, or in this case, pencil and paper. Please note that this tutorial will only be covering the traditional style of backgrounds. If you'd like any additional tutorials, for example, digital backgrounds, please leave a comment saying so. The reason I start out with pencil is because it's easier to erase. If you've got a Frixon erasable pen, you can get past this whole requirement, but most other types of pens won't be very forgiving if you make a mistake. I use .7 for the most part, but occasionally I'll stick to .5 when I want thinner lines. You'll also see that I'm wearing a smudge guard drawing glove. This is handy because when you're using graphite and you're touching it with your bare hands, it tends to smudge everywhere. This glove should prevent that from happening. I tend to draw the characters first, then draw the background around them. But in this particular tutorial, I'll be skipping that step and going straight to the background. What I like to do is start out by blocking out a structure. Then I can decide the small details that will go around it. Usually I have some sort of preconceived notion of how the building will be set up, but I always leave room to improve and improvise. This is another reason to use pencil over pen when you're starting out. Otherwise, you may find yourself stuck with a mistake that you can't get rid of. In this particular example, you see me drawing a science fiction background, consisting mostly of structures with a few natural elements that I'll add in later. For inspiration, I looked up science fiction backgrounds that other people have drawn, as well as existing structures that are a little more futuristic in their appearance. Such buildings make really great inspiration, because a lot of sci-fi is influenced by what the future looks like, or could look like. A lot of the structures that I reference in this particular case were based on buildings that I saw during my trip to Europe, in particular the ones I saw in London. Of course, you don't need to actually go anywhere in order to see things that might inspire you. Google search is actually a great source of imagery. You never know when inspiration will strike or what it will come from. So use all the tools available to you to your advantage. That being said, it's important to make sure that whatever you create is your own, not just someone else's work redone in your style. Notice how I'm adding smaller buildings to the background to contrast with the larger buildings that already exist. This is a common trope in science fiction. It's also true to the fact that the more populous a city is, the more buildings that are going to be needed. And here, you see me start working on a cliff face. First, I block it out a little, and then add more lines to the side to give it the illusion of a rock face. Then I add a lot of rocks, because, well, rocks are cool. There's no need to put so much detail into the rocks that they look absolutely completely realistic, just enough to get by. The reason I'm leaving it largely blank in comparison to the rest of the background is because this is normally where the hero or heroine would stand. Always leave room for the hero of the story. After a bit more detailing on the existing building, you're going to see me start adding structures near where the cliff face is. This helps contrast the natural organic feel of the cliff face with the inorganic feel of the city structures. 
you'll also see me adding little details such as antennas as well as diagonal windows and even some smokestacks in the background. Each of these little details goes a long way in reinforcing the illusion that this is in fact a city that exists within its own little world. I won't make you watch the entire thing, I'll do a quick jump cut in a second. Now you see me adding another structure, a much larger structure, near where the cliff face was placed originally. The inclusion of this new building, and all of its detail, creates a three-dimensional effect. Because the building is so much larger than all of the other buildings around it, it appears much closer to the cliff face than the other buildings do. This is actually one of the easier ways to create a three-dimensional effect. Now I add more detailing onto the smokestacks that I created earlier. Then, after a little bit of detailing on the windows and such, I'll add one of the key components of science fiction, flying vehicles. A lot of cities in the future will use airborne transportation rather than ground-based transportation. Of course, not all science fiction cities follow this rule, so things like futuristic highways and other types of transportation are still perfectly acceptable. Here you see me doing detailing on one of the larger ships. A lot of the smaller ships that I'll draw in later will be drawn farther away, again to create the 3D effect. So therefore they will lack a whole lot of detail, but from a distance they can pass for being starships. One thing you can do to create the illusion of a very busy city is to have all of the distant starships and such, and even some of the closer ones, traveling very close together, similar to how a school of fish would operate. I want to create the illusion of a continuous line of activity, so I draw most of the starships going behind or around the buildings themselves. This creates the illusion that there is a lot of air traffic going back and forth. It's worth noting that not everything needs to be the same level of detail in the background. For example, distant structures, which are represented largely by blocks in the background, are perfectly acceptable, as it creates a depth of field effect. Because things are so far away, they become much harder to see. Therefore, they don't need the same level of detail as everything else. Now, once I finally have the drawing the way I want it and can't improve on it anymore with pencil, we move on to phase three, the inking phase. Here, I use my Marvula Pen technical drawing pen, which I discussed in earlier videos, to solidify the structures by inking them out. This is essentially just tracing over the original lines with the pen. It's very tiresome and very tedious, but it will help you later on when you get to the scanning phase. I won't show you too much of this one because you've already watched me draw it, so I'll just skip ahead to this next part, the scanning phase. For this part, I'm assuming you have a scan. If you don't, you can take pictures with your camera, just be aware that it won't get you the best quality result. Step one, connect the scanner to your computer, if it isn't already connected, and turn it on. Step two, place picture into the scanner carefully, making sure it's at the right orientation. You don't want to scan it upside down. Step three, scan the picture in and save it as a PNG file. JPEG is the next best thing, but PNG is ideal if you're going to post it online. There are other file formats you can use, I'm just telling you what I would use. This concludes this tutorial. Want more art tips? Leave a comment or subscribe. And be sure to check out my art tips playlist for more videos that I've done. If you want to see more art, visit my DeviantArt page. The link is in the description. I'll see you next time, art peeps.